Uh, no notes on the on the, the desktop. Oh, okay. yeah, you'd have to have a uh, laptop for that. Sure. Okay, um, I'm going to give you this as well. Sure. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you don't have to wear this. It does help. But yeah. Because we've got this one here. Um. So it's on. Yeah. Uh, green means you're unmuted and on. If you want to mute yourself, just tap that. Yeah. And it goes amber, and then just tap it, and you're on again. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. And that can go on a belt or a pocket. And then this just clips anywhere. Here's the clip there. Okay. Excellent. And I think that's it. Everything's good. Okay. Are, are we going to oh, just start? Oh, sure. I think uh, Victor and Michelle said they were going to come to the send me a message.
Yeah, yeah, children's and women's. Well, other sites, I think we can uh, get started uh, with today's program. Uh, I'm Bob Schellenberg in Algae Immunology, and it's my pleasure today to introduce Dr. Raymond Mack, who's one of our graduates from here and known to probably most of you in terms of interactions in internal medicine. He has a wide outreach, and even during his fellowship, took the initiative to set up teaching programs with the uh, uh, family practice group and so forth, so that uh, he's a great teacher, and when you get to be my vintage, you rely on people like him to teach you and to get the passive knowledge. Uh, so uh, we're pleased to have him, and he has a special interest in terms of adverse drug reactions, and will speak to us in some aspects of that today. Right. <clears throat> So over the next hour, we're going to talk mainly about penicillin allergy and really the scope of the problem that's become and what we can do um, both as individuals as well as an institution to address this huge problem. The learning objectives for today, to uh, gain a better appreciation of penicillin allergy, we have to review some basic science, uh, the Giles and Coombs classification of drug reactions, which most people were exposed to during their medical school. And then understand the pathogen is how we develop allergies and really what happens to them as time goes on. We're going to go through some strategies that have been adopted at a variety of institutions, both in Canada and the U.S., and how effective they are. And lastly, we'll just apply some of the knowledge to two cases um, in terms of how to risk stratify patients with a reported penicillin allergy. So I'll, I'll present the cases first, and you can keep them in mind, and then at the end, we'll kind of discuss them further in detail. The first case, you're seeing a 30-year-old male with strep pneumobacteremia. He reports a history of highs lasting one day when he took penicillin for strep throat at age 28. He had associated stomach upset and vomited within 30 minutes of the last ingested dose and felt also quite wheezy. So you've probably seen patients similar to this um, in the hospital, and then how would you approach these patients? So try to keep in mind what you would do currently. Would you avoid all beta-lactams in this individual and, uh, or avoid only penicillins and select cephalosporins? Refer to allergy immediately for skin testing or challenge the patient to see if it's a true allergy. Would you use an alternative antibiotic such as vancomycin or simply advise the patient that they're not allergic? The next patient is a 40-year-old female whom you are seeing in the emergency room. You're hoping to discharge her on clavulin, which you deem is the most appropriate antibiotic. However, she reports she is allergic and had a rash when she took penicillin for strep throat at age 12. How would you approach this patient? And again, 
the options are similar, would you avoid all the beta-lactam cephalosporins, refer them to allergy? Would you challenge them in the ER to see if it's a true allergy, or advise the patient simply that they're not allergic? So keep these options in mind, and as we go throughout the talk, maybe you'll um, either confirm or change some of your opinions. So to form a basis of our discussion, we really need to review the gel and Coons classification. This is an immune um, kind of way of dividing drug allergies. And it's really important to divide allergies between immediate and delayed. So type 1 allergies are those immediate allergies that within an hour to six hours of exposure, you can develop hives, breathing difficulties, angioedema, and even anaphylactic shock. Delayed reactions, however, come on after that time period and often last quite a long time. And it's useful to know that with immediate uh, um, reactions, skin testing is useful. For all the other ones, it's not um, that beneficial. The other uh, delayed reactions can range from hemolytic anemia to um, serum sickness to more severe ones such as DRESS or uh, SJS10s or AGEP, which are rare but potentially life-threatening. The majority, however, are mobiliform rashes, which are benign. Focusing on type 1 hypersensitivity, when a patient is exposed to antibiotics the first time, they develop an allergy um, by developing antibodies, IgE. These subsequently attach to mast cells and are found in the tissue. And when exposed again, you would have a rapid onset reaction. The principle of this is where skin testing comes in. There are mast cells located underneath the skin, and when we expose small amounts of antigen, you can develop a hive at the site of exposure. The features of the immediate hypersensitivity is that they're fast on, fast off, reproducible, and even small amounts can potentially lead to anaphylaxis. It's important to know that it's actually not the penicillin itself that's usually the causative agent. It's the breakdown products, particularly the major determinant, which is the most common cause for allergic reactions. And there are other minor determinants um, that are less likely to cause reactions. Penicillin itself is immunologically inert. So by just a show of hands, how common do you think penicillin allergy is reported? Is it 1% of the population? 3% of the population, 10% of the population, or 15% of the population. So I see most hands raised for 15% of the population. The answer is actually 10% of the population. How many of these individuals are actually not allergic? Is it 30%, 50%, 70%, or 90%? So the majority, 90% of these people are not allergic to penicillin. So this kind of highlights the answer. Approximately 10% are um, report an allergy. So in thinking about Canada, we have about 30 million individuals. So that's 3 million people with a label. But 90% of these people do not actually have a penicillin allergy. And the rate of anaphylaxis is actually even more rare. When we look at parental administration, it's estimated to be 1 in 10,000 treated patients. And that's by far a more risky way of um, administering medications. When we look at the UK data, over 100 million doses were, um, or 100 million patients were exposed over a period of 30 um, years, and there was only one case of anaphylaxis resulting in death from oral administration. So why is it that all these people are being mislabeled? Part of the reason is that childhood rashes are blamed on the penicillin. From one study in 2011, where they looked at children going into the ER, 90. Um, Seven, or sorry, 94% of these individuals were later challenged and did not have a recurrent reaction. The initial mobiliform rash was blamed on the penicillin. Similarly with urticaria, we know in children the infection itself can be a cause of urticaria. So a reported history of urticaria in children does not necessarily um, mean that they had an IgE-mediated reaction. So let's assume someone does have a true penicillin allergy. How many percent will it grow after 10 years? A, penicillin allergy is not a, uh, outgrowable. It's a permanent allergy. 10% by 10 years, 20% by 10 years, 50% by 10 years, or 80% for 10 years, or unknown. So, I saw a couple hands for 
the um, 20%, 50 as well as the 80%? The answer is that 80% will outgrow by 10 years and 50% by, by five years. So it's not a lifelong allergy. And if it's a remote reaction, chances are very good that someone has outgrown it. But how do we know these numbers? This data is actually very old. It came from the 90s um, with individuals who have confirmed reaction um, to amoxicillin. We followed them over time with skin testing, and about 50% will outgrow it by five years. And if they were only allergic to the amoxicillin and not the any other um, major or minor determinants, they outgrew their allergy much quicker. So by five years, in that subset, group B, 100% outgrew it by five years. The data for the 80% by 10 years comes from the 1980s. At that time, um, at a single center, Washington University, they looked at all the skin testing performed in six year period, and they looked at a variety of variables to determine who were skin test positive. And they found that the majority of skin test positive individuals had a reaction within one year. However, if their reaction was 10 years, it was only 22% skin test positivity. And in addition to that, in the last um, several, uh, decade, um, or two decades ago, it's been found that the rate of penicillin allergy is actually reduced. So this study done in California found that um, not only does a remote reaction uh, predict less likely having positive skin tests, but also over time, the overall rate of having skin tests were, uh, positivity was less and less. And one of the reasons for that was postulated that we're not prescribing as many antibiotics. And for, by fewer exposures, we're having fewer um, rates of um, penicillin allergy. So now we can appreciate that there's a huge um, population of individuals in, our, uh, in Canada who are allergic. But why does it really matter? There's a substantial health care impact. In fact, this a systematic review published in 2018, I believe one of the individuals, uh, Dr. Young, is on this um, article who works here at St. Paul's. It found that there's suboptimal antibiotic selection, increased drug-resistant uh, organisms, higher costs, and increased toxic effects. For example, if you were to treat an individual with Piptazo, you would be able to cover gram-positives, gram-negatives, pseudomonas, and uh, anaerobes, whereas if you were to do the same combination with an alternative, you may have to choose Cipro, Flagyl, plus Banco, and having exposure to multiple antibiotics increases your risks of side effects as well as potential for um, increased allergies to these medications. And, and the same flip side, if we're able to delabel patients, we may be able to save the hospital money as well as use more appropriate antibiotics. So what can we do with this so-called penicillin pseudo-allergy epidemic? What are some tools available? And these are both tools that you as individual clinicians can employ, as well as institutional-wide tools. So firstly, a detailed clinical history is paramount. Penicillin skin test is one option, particularly for immediate reactions. Um, provocative oral challenge as well as clinical decision tools and algorithms. And we'll go through each of these clinical tools and the evidence behind it. For clinical history, I'd like to highlight one of um, numerous studies that have been published. This one was in 2018. This was done in Australia over a single center over 18 week period in 2016. It included anyone who was an adult and able to provide a history with, uh, and they had to have a label of an antibiotic allergy. So patients who are intubated, delirious, or unable to provide a reliable history were excluded. Clinical pharmacists reviewed the chart as well as took history um, of what happened, including um, the chronology and previous evaluations. And generated from this, um, they found 352 patients included uh, in the study and 426 adverse antibiotic labels were found. Only 50% had a possible history that was in keeping with a um, uh, drug allergy, including all sorts of um, like type 1 to type 4 allergy. Half, however, had histories that were either vague or inappropriate. And so an example of an inappropriate history would be someone who took penicillin and, for a pneumonia and felt that their cough got worse. Or, for example, I felt nauseous. There was one uh, example that I remember when I was rotating through 10C in which this patient had a penicillin label, and when further questioning, she said her friend 
who's not a uh, medical professional, said that maybe some of the symptoms of fatigue and headache that she was expo um, experiencing around the time of her infection was an allergy. And so subsequently, this label perpetuated throughout her chart. So by looking at this, they estimated approximately 20% of people can be immediately delabeled and received appropriate antibiotics just based on a simple history alone. Another tiny pilot study in 2016 looked at having pharmacists take detailed histories and making recommendations, and they recruited 32 patients in this tiny pilot study, and 21 of them, through history alone, were able to be switched to a beta-lactam just based on a detailed history. Subsequent to that, several other studies have been reproduced looking at pharmacists taking detailed histories and the reduced rate of um, uh, alternative antibiotics. When we're taking a history, we're really going through our mind and risk stratifying patients. When we take a history that sounds suspicious for anaphylaxis, for example, they received epinephrine, went to the ER, then we automatically assume in our mind that it's a higher risk um, individual. At the same time, if it's a remote reaction or subjective symptoms or non-allergic symptoms, we're subconsciously risk stratifying patients to have lower risk. However, if we hear other um, red flags such as they needed oral steroids or their skin was peeling and they had conjunctivitis, we may be more concerned about this particular history. So everyone as a clinician, when we're taking a history, this is subconsciously occurring in our minds at figuring out, is this a high risk or a low risk patient? These are just some factors that have been um, published in terms of what would can constitute a low risk. So reactions occurring more than 10 years ago, subjective symptoms, or cutaneous symptoms only. Family history is not predictive of a penicillin allergy. So let's move on to the second tool that we have available, and this is skin testing. This is an in vivo testing, and if a patient is very high risk, we may start with a prick test before intradermal. It's useful, as I mentioned, only for ruling out immediate reactions, and it must include the major determinant, because we know that that is the most uh, likely culprit agent. Approximately 75% of positive skin tests were a result of the major determinant. So this is just a picture for people who have not ever seen skin testing. So the patient on the left has negative skin tests, and the one on the right has positive skin tests to um, the major determinant. So you can clearly see in the first individual there's um, no hives at the um, penicillin as well as the major determinant, whereas in the other individual, there is a big welt at the major determinant. Having a negative skin test um, is very good at ruling out these life-threatening reactions with a 97 to 99% accuracy. And subsequent to that, after they uh, have a negative skin test, patients are often challenged, and the 1% the that do react, it tends to be a, a mild rash, uh, often urticaria. The positive predictive value, however, is uh, largely unknown because we often avoid um, uh, administering penicillin if the skin test is positive. So how can we use skin testing as a tool for delabeling patients? So at a variety of centers across North America, they have adopted an active screening um, approach. In fact, at St. Paul's, we've been doing this for several years now. Individuals who come in potentially for unrelated issues are flagged and routinely receive skin tests as a way to um, assess their uh, allergy. At our center is the allergy and immunology fellows or some of the staff who perform the skin testing, but it's been shown in a variety of different settings that other individuals can do skin testing safely. For example, nurses with um, Dr. Macy's group in California as well as in Texas pharmacists and uh, have been performing it as well as um, specialized physicians trained in this procedure. How effective is skin testing in terms of patient outcomes? From systematic uh, review and meta-analysis, looking at all the studies um, where pen penicillin skin testing was the predominant approach, they looked at the primary outcomes of changes in antibiotic prescription as well as cost to um, uh, the hospital. Overall, there was a 65% improvement in appropriate antibiotics. And in the critically ill, there was a much higher um, uh, change at 78%. Overall, for inpatients, there was a 54% improvement. 
this um, example was not included in the systematic review because it was published in the same year that the systematic review was published. But I'd like to highlight this particular example because it's a Canadian example it's in Toronto across three separate hospitals. And just to highlight what they did in particular. So their procedure would involve any individual who's flagged with um, a penicillin allergy would automatically get an assessment by a trained clinical pharmacist who took a detailed history. Um, people with high-risk features, such as anaphylaxis or reactions um, that were fairly um, uh, recent, were excluded from um, their screening procedure, as well as if there were medications that may have interfered with skin tests. If they were deemed appropriate, the consent was performed by an um, infectious disease specialist, and the next day, the pharmacist would actually perform the skin testing. If that was negative, an oral, food, uh, oral um, penicillin challenge was administered by a nurse and monitored for four hours. And if nothing happens, then a handout is provided to the patient um, to tell them that they're not allergic. So from this particular study um, done across three hospitals, they looked at a first period, um, a baseline um, uh, kind of antibiotic prescription um, uh, Pattern. So about 50% of uh, patients uh, with uh, antibiotic allergy were appropriately treated with beta-lactams during the um, control period. They did a staged um, uh, implement implementation of this um, uh, procedure across the three hospitals, three months at a time. And during the intervention period, the baseline um, uh, appropriate antibiotic was 60%. After skin testing, that increased to 80%. So there was a 20% increase in appropriate um, antibiotic usage during the intervention period. This is just an aside. Some of you may have heard of specific IgE or immunocap to penicillin. So just to explain, this is an ELISA-based uh, ELISA assay, and it is available here in BC, but the utility is very poor. Um, published from European guidelines in 2016, really says that many false positives can occur, and the sensitivity is only about 50, 0 to 50 percent. So it's a, a test that's not very helpful and is adding cost to our um, system. So it's something that I do not encourage individuals to order. The reason for this is the serum-specific IgE actually decreases over time and will become negative in the majority of individuals after three years of exposures. This is the study that kind of uh, summarizes this. So we'll move on to the next step. And this is an exciting part of penicillin allergy as we're moving more and more towards oral pro provocation as a tool towards um, assessing penicillin allergy. So in 2016, this was one of the first uh, studies that was performed. Uh, it was done in Montreal, uh, predominantly in children. There were about 800 children included. And these ha children had rashes um, that were felt to be secondary to um, amoxicillin. Subsequent to um, investigation, it was actually found the majority of these uh, individuals, 770 of them, were tolerant, and only 17% of them uh, had immediate reactions, so very low risk of a reaction. None of these individuals required epinephrine. And then some people did develop, um, uh, subsequently, a delayed rash. But again, the rates are extremely low. In those individuals who did react, 100% of them were able to tolerate suffixine. So even in individuals who are penicillin allergic, there should be no, very little reason to avoid certain cephalosporins if there is no cross-reactivity. Subsequent to that, there have been several other studies uh, performed looking at the role of direct oral provocation as a way of um, ruling out drug allergy in a variety of settings. So the first one that I'd like to highlight was one done in healthy marine recruits in the US. And this one included over 300 individuals and found that only 1.5% had immediate reactions. And again, none of them required epinephrine. The next was uh, one that was done in um, Israel. And this one is an interesting study because um, they did skin testing on all the individuals, but ignored the results um, completely. In these individuals, the inclusion criteria were they either had a delayed reaction, so a history that was not in keeping with an IgE-mediated reaction, or they had a remote or vague history um, that uh, is unclear. In this study, there was, again, very low rates of reaction, um, estimated about 2.6%. And interestingly, those who reacted did not necessarily need to have, uh, did not necessarily have positive skin tests. I believe only one of them did. 
And the third one, um, this one um, is 150 patients, and they performed oral challenge. This one I found was interesting because they actually did a placebo first. And in this, um, a certain proportion of people reacted to the placebo. And so this kind of highlights that oftentimes we may have a um, nocebo effect in, when performing an oral uh, provocation challenge. So how do we actually, um, or who should we actually challenge? The gold standard of assessing pe uh, penicillin allergy is still considered an oral challenge. The individuals who have a history of a severe cutaneous uh, reaction, such as SJS10s, DRAS, vasculitis, or hematologic um, uh, reactions, should not receive an oral challenge, as these can potentially be life-threatening conditions. Other considerations are if the individual is ill at the time of um, a challenge. For example, someone who comes in with a COPD exacerbation and is actively wheezy or hemodynamically unstable. If you were to perform a challenge and their blood pressure drops, it's hard to know, is it the sepsis or is it their underlying uh, or a potential penicillin allergy? Similarly, with the wheeziness, it may be misconstrued as a penicillin allergy. And in certain populations, for example, the pregnant um, uh, individuals, even though the risk is fairly low, it's still not a 0% risk. And when we directly challenge pregnant ladies, uh, if they do anaphylax, there's the potential negative outcome of fetal loss. And again, I highlighted even doing a um, penicillin challenge, we, we, there is a well-known what we call the nocebo effect in up to 10% of drug challenges. So even if you gave an individual um, a uh, placebo, they may still have subjective symptoms. So it's very important to document objective symptoms. And lastly, we'll go through some clinical decision tools and algorithms. At St. Paul's, they have developed the spectrum uh, app, which is something I'm not sure if anyone's ever used the Spectrum app. So that's one that's developed locally. But there are a variety of other algorithms that have been um, uh, done across um, various centers in ca uh, Canada and the US. So this one I'd like to highlight. It was done in, by Harvard. It implemented across five different hospitals, both community and academic um, institutions. It was an electronic uh, guideline that was integrated into their EMR. And it was also integrated into the intranet as well as mobile friendly. So it was very accessible to the hospitals. They started with an education campaign that was hospital wide, both in person as well as videos. And then they also had an integrated uh, test dose order set to make it user friendly. So this is just an example. We won't go through their particular al algorithm, but basically after a history, you, you divide the re reactions based on the gel and clume classification, and it tells you what you should do. For example, um, if it was a mild reaction, you may do the test uh, dose procedure. Uh, if it's one of these severe uh, type 2 to 4 reactions, um, then you avoid the penicillin. If it's a, a potential anaphylactic reaction, you may want to um, consult an allergist at that time or use an alternative um, uh, cephalosporin in, um, in this case. So this is what they did at academic hospitals where there was access to an allergist. In hospitals where there were less um, access to allergists, they had a different algorithm. So now that we look at um, the variety of strategies that have been employed at delabeling patients, which one is the most effective? There's very little literature comparing the variety of strategies, but this particular study did look at comparing both the algorithm, which I kind of went through um, that was done at Harvard, as well as um, skin testing. So they looked at a single a hospital, um, Brigham Women's College, and they looked at the standard of care period, and they compared it to the skin testing period, and then when the guideline um, was implemented. And they wanted to look at prescribing practices during that time. They wanted to see, was there an increased use of penicillin and cephalosporin? There were some se secondary outcomes, such as um, whether they were discharged of penicillin, whether they had alternative antibiotics or adverse reactions. They used an intention to treat analysis. And then they did also a per protocol analysis for the skin testing. It's interesting to look that during the skin testing um, period, there were 300, uh, uh, almost 300 assessed for eligibility, and 179 were deemed appropriate, but only 43 received skin testing in their center, so only a 25% rate. And there were a variety of reasons why people um, did not receive skin tests. It was too close to discharge, the patient refused their test, 
the inpatient team refused to allow the antimicrobial team to test their patients, or they were transferred before skin testing was performed. So very not a very successful implementation during this period. When we compare the results, during the standard of care period, 38% were treated with cephalosporins or penicillins. When they implemented the computerized guideline, that increased to 50% with an odds ratio of 1.8. Overall, during the skin testing period, there was really no difference compared to the standard care period. But one of the big um, reasons was because it was not uh, implemented correctly. If we looked at a per-protocol analysis, those who did receive skin testing, 72% were treated with penicillin with an odds ratio of 5.7. So this really illustrates, if you look at the picture, we do have strategies, but implementation for, and um, from an institutional uh, standpoint is very important because although we have all these available tools, if it's not utilized, then um, we're not use, using our resources effectively. And despite all our efforts, we know that persistent labels um, exist. So individuals with negative skin tests, negative challenge, about 40 to 50% of them come back the next time with the same label on their chart despite not having had um, uh, any exposure to penicillins in the interim. And for example, a patient who, with negative skin testing and past oral challenge, the, the, the patients themselves are still very hesitant to receiving penicillin in the future. For example, 18% of parents continue to refuse penicillin use in their children. And for some odd reason, um, even if it's been removed, and when we look down, it's been, uh, at some point, 36% of patients will have this label added again with no clear reason. So documentation is paramount. Having connection between the EMR and PharmaNet and um, community pharmacies, as well as family physicians, um, this com uh, communication breakdown is one of the big problems why we have persistent labels. So, I'd just like to kind of end my talk with a couple of um, initiatives that have been uh, instituted in Vancouver. So St. Paul's, the antimicrobial stewardship program with allergy has been doing skin testing based um, uh, delabeling for the last several years. And I'm, um, I was told that over 400 patients were successfully delabeled. And a spectrum questionnaire is something that has been developed that could help any physician, whether it's an um, internist or subspecialist, utilize um, appropriate antibiotics. At ER, um, uh, for VGH, um, one of the ER physicians is trying to work on a better documentation system so that when individuals enter the ER, if they've been delabeled, that would be communicated um, to the ER physician so that they can use penicillin-based antibiotics. At BC Children's Hospital, we've developed an in-house algorithm and trained pharmacists, and we're trying to implement direct oral challenge for inpatients. We've successfully um, delabeled many outpatients, but the next stage now is to um, enter the inpatient realm. And at the BCCDC, I did provide nursing education in the summer, um, and they've developed a screening form for nurses to use and a referral mechanism to allergists so that um, patients with um, uh, sexually transmitted infections can be treated appropriately, for example, syphilis. At BC Women's, I'll be starting a delabeling clinic for pregnant uh, women in the um, spring of this year. And at VGH, I'm involved currently with a delabeling um, uh, pharmacist uh, through BMT transplant patients in between their um, transplant and their uh, diagnosis of um, a hematologic malignancy. So let's go back to our last our cases. For the first patient, this one was the one who had anaphylaxis. And so in terms of an approach, hopefully at the end of this, you would um, appreciate that this is a high-risk patient, that we should avoid penicillins for now and refer to allergy for skin testing to evaluate whether um, they are truly allergic. Probably not safe um, in the setting of sepsis to challenge this patient directly to penicillin. Um, and uh, using an alternative antibiotic in the interim may be appropriate. And the second individual where we had a remote rash it would not be appropriate to avoid all antibiotics. And in, and in your setting, either you can challenge them in the ER if you feel comfortable with performing a challenge, or refer them for an allergy assessment at that time. So these are a couple of my references um, from, for the talk. Are there any questions? Yeah. I talked really quickly, it was only half an hour. So questions from the audience? 
more questions? So, Raymond, yeah. how are we right now once the patient would be labeled? How is that information currently being sent around? Yeah, so um, at VGH, we have the pharmacist um, uh, fill out a PharmaNet uh, removal form. So it gets go gone to PharmaNet. We give the patient a piece of a paper that says you've been successfully delabeled, and the di dictation goes to the family doctor. Um, there's issues with PCIS and removing the label there because um, they don't allow us to remove rashes even if it's had a successful oral challenge because they theoretically could still develop a rash once they've left the hospital. So we would add on underneath penicillin skin test negative, oral challenge negative as a way of um, telling physicians they've been assessed uh, and but the, the label of the rash still stays on their EMR. But we're looking to try to fix that. At St. Paul's, um, I'm not sure in terms of uh, how they integrate it into the EMR uh, here. I guess Victor can comment. Yeah. Fill out the form and document exactly what you said there so that gets transcribed. We also sent a form to the PharmaNet, so it'll be modified on PharmaNet. The problem with PharmaNet is when you do a printout, you only see the first line. So again, they can't remove anything, they can only add information on. So it's dependent on the patient. So for the last year, we've developed a wallet card. Michelle has wallet cards with her today, so please take one so you can see what it's like. And the goal is to encourage the patient to take ownership of their own health. Uh, remind We remind them to show it to all their physicians and when they go to hospital. And the card is, I guess, a permanent, more like a vaccine card that uh, they can call if they have questions. And the other thing I encourage everyone to do is just uh, look at the app because after doing the eight questions, it provides a structure to how to gather a history and then they can call the stewardship team so that we can liaise with your team uh, whether they can go to direct oral challenge or not. And at BC Children's for the um, EMR, it's very user friendly. Um, the physician can actually delete the allergy label from the computer if they've deemed it to be um, uh, not a true allergy. Uh, Raymond, I had a question about your direct oral challenge protocol. So from the studies you quoted, there was various timelines between the exposure and the subsequent oral challenge. What are you recommending for a time period? Like, do you say more than five years after exposure? Yeah, there, there, there's a lot of variety, and I don't think the um, consensus is out. Some, some of them looked at even just a one over one year uh, period of time that would be considered slightly delayed. Um, like, is, but then a majority for me personally, I usually use five uh, years as my cutoff. Um, but there's no universal. Um, clear cut that has to wait five years or 10 years. But the longer we wait, the less likely they are truly allergic. If it is IgE mediated, and but we really don't know for those other rashes, like mobiliform rashes, et cetera. The um, pediatric one, some of these reactions were actually very recent within like months of their reaction and they were still challenged and they had um, a low rate of reaction. From that. Yes, Donna. To clarify, what to do when a person who presents or you're asked to evaluate uh, the cephalospore allergy? Do we do automatic penicillin become or we can't justifiably for cephalospore and avoid them? What's what your recommendation? It will depend if they initially reacted to the cephalosporin or if they reacted to penicillin. If they reacted to penicillin and um, with no history of cephalosporin allergy, we would delabel their penicillin allergy and they'd be safe to get both. If it was an actual cephalosporin allergy, on the other hand, um, I would say that in, um, we would look at the cross-reactivity chart. Um, so there's published charts that are available in a, at the pharmacies um, across the lower mainland. And you can see which ones have similar side chains um, and the ones that have similar side chains, we would want to avoid those, whereas ones that have, um, for example, ANSEF or cefazolin does not have any uh, similar side chains to the other cephalosporins, so can be used safely even in individuals who have, say, for example, a ceftriaxone allergy or um, a Keflex allergy. Yeah. Comment on um, the mechanism of an amoxyl-related rash, and because I've always been under the impression that a rash can is quite common with amoxyl, and 
for right or wrong, I've always thought that that doesn't necessarily extend to all penicillin allergies. You may yeah. have already said that. I don't know. Yeah. So um, with amoxyl rash, uh, certain cofactors can increase your risk of developing rash. For example, if you had EBV infection, um, like uh, mono plus amoxyl, for some odd reason, the two combined can have a rate of a rash of 80% um, on exposure, but doesn't necessarily mean you'll have it again. There's, it's complicated. There is other um, individuals who have an immune system primed to developing reaction. It's called the uh, pharmacologic interaction with the T-cell receptor, where they have T-cells that are there that would recognize as being born and then can develop a rash even on the first exposure, but that's very rare. In uh, children, um, the, the rashes are felt to be viral-induced um, uh, instead of the um, uh, actual allergic mechanism. And that was through the studies that I um, highlighted at the beginning of my talk. Um, so these were... For those that missed the talk, you're now seeing it again. Yeah. So the, the, this one, um, where they had over 130 patients, I believe, that went to the ER and they blamed them oxacillin, uh, and actually only 6.8% of them um, were later challenge positive. So the majority was actually infection, particularly childhood rashes. So do you think it's physicians that are very persuasive in inculcating this concept of penicillin allergy? Do you think it's parents? Do you think it's... I mean, yeah, well, most things we say are blown off or at least considered, but put in contact with penicillin allergy seems to have its own religion. Yeah, I think part of the reason is uh, how medical school was taught in the past that uh, allergies are potentially very life-threatening and we need to strictly avoid. And so we clump all sorts of reactions as allergies. And family physicians um, may feel it's safer to kind of just provide this label as opposed to delabeling patients. Whereas now we know that the problem is the label itself leads to inappropriate antibiotic usage as well as increased resistance. So um, it's a problem of potentially how we were taught in the um, days of old uh, in terms of medical school teaching, as well as parents are often quite anxious whenever they see rashes as well, so it's a combination. Um, but I think now that we have a large problem, it's not just the sole responsibility of, say, allergist or um, antimicrobial stewardship uh, to kind of delabel because it's such a huge problem. We need to really share the responsibility, whether it's taking a detailed history or performing some lower risk challenges um, to improve patient care. Any other comments or questions? Um, if not, before I thank Dr. Mack, um, next week's Grand Rounds is bariatric surgery. Brought, I think it's the Division of Endocrinology that's going to be presenting. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's great. That's great. You built them out. Yeah. Even great. the history, then. It's it is. It's great to just remind everyone it's on the Spectrum app, like just to probe. And these are really good questions, yeah, right? It's a number that you can just call. Cool. Yeah, yeah, it's fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah. How much? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. I'm finalizing. Oh, yeah, we got 18 years old. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
or at least in adult education. And then we want to empower people to do that output. And we also want to allow them to have that training. It's very pointless. Now, again, that's <laughs> my end. It's yeah, acceptable to make sure it's possible to build on that. More information. Okay, we'll share it. Share it. Share it with everyone. At least by email. Okay, she moved to that. Your call will be disconnected. <laughs> 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 